Good afternoon or good evening. Brandon. Hello, Narupa. How are you? I'm good. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's How are you? I'm good. I'm really good. I'm like, I'm, I'm glad that 2021 is over and that <laughs> we are at least, you know, moving into um, 2022. And um, it's, it's been an exciting transition so far. Exciting is, is a good word. I actually was curious as to why you decided to do the opening exploration for this year. You brought up the topic of justice, a very heavy and social a very justice, social, social justice. justice, social justice, justice and yoga. Well, I, well, first of all, you know, last year we had, we had, was the first year we had under the new brand. And in January, I was asked to be part of a, of something that the Jersey City Library was doing, which was to celebrate the January. The January is a UK thing that they've created where they're trying to promote veganism for one month and get people maybe to think about their diet. So I, last year I wrote um, a really interesting exploration called The Goddess and the Goat, which was about hurting cultures and the loss of spirituality and how women were affected in the realm of spirituality by moving away from um, agricultural societies that were hunter-gatherers into a herding culture and um, male-dominated systems. Uh, more patriarchal ma systems. Ma more patriarchal systems. This year I chose to, um, you know, one of the things that has happened in American yoga especially is the incorporation of social justice and the ideas of social justice within American society. And, you know, let's be honest, most people who practice yoga, I, I, I at least I assume because I'm on the left, are left oriented or progressive thinkers. And um, so this month I, I was looking at like um, social justice, veganism and yoga and how they all work together in this paradigm that we're in right now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, there's, a, there's a complexity to the topic of this month, which is why I wanted to ask the, the root and the origin of your inspiration. But before we even delve into this, because my understanding from speaking to you is that social justice is a 20th century concept, it's a Western Absolutely. concept. Veganism is a 20th century construct. Western. Western. But before we even go into that, could you just actually give me the literal translation of Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu? So um, uh, the literal translation, so... Lo and your interpretation, of course, right? right? Well, like and I still use Sharon Gannon's interpretation. Okay. So Loka's location, Samasta is same or equal, standing, Sukhino is a sweet middle, above is an energetic, Unto is that's what I'd wish, Sharon Gannon's interpretation that we still use in the Urban Sadhu Yoga chant book, which you can get on Amazon. I'm going to plug myself right now. Um, you should put it in the show notes. The and the on. show notes uh, is, may all beings everywhere be happy and free, and may the thoughts, the words, and the actions of my own life contribute in some small way to that happiness and to that freedom for all. She added that word small later on. Um, we're focused on the, in this essay, we're actually focused on a Yoga Sutra from the Tanjali's Yoga Sutra, Yoga Sutra chapter 235, ahimsa, meaning non-violation, pratishtayam tat samnido varag tayagaha. Translated, when one is established in non-violation, ahimsa, others will stop violating and harming you. Now, what Patanjali's pointing to is the golden rule. Mm -hmm. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the golden rule can be found in every culture around the world in different forms. So you can find it you, um, uh, in China. We can can find you it. repeat the golden rule for those that are not from America? So. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you, want to, if you want respect, then respect others. If you want kindness, be kind to others. If you are mean to others, they will be mean back to you. It's, 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 it's that idea that you'll get what you put out. Yeah. And um, a lot of times ahimsa is translated into non-violence or non-harming. 
I have translated it into non-violation. When I first was introduced to the word ahimsa, and it was introduced to me as non-violence, I thought it meant not to hit, because I came from a family of hitters. Oh. Like, you know, like you, you did something wrong, you got hit. So I took that literally as like, don't hit anybody. And then, it, you know, then they were like, no, 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 it's non-harming. Well, that still kind of seems like gross, big gesture, right? As I started... What do you mean, so, sorry, when you say gross, big gesture, you're saying it's too big and abstract? It's, or still, like it's still like, it's still kind of impact, don't harm. You know, there's kind of an impact there mm. that's kind of broad and um, seems like it needs to be a big mm. moment. As I started practicing, and actually it was my friend Deb Dutt who put the idea of non-violation into my head. He said that one time. He said, well, ahims is really non-violation. And I said, yes, because that's subtle, right? And he said, right, a violation is subtle. Like a violation is different from non-violence and non-harming. Non-violation means I really have to think about my actions on the most subtle levels and think, am I violating you? Not yeah. am I harming you, because harm, you know when I harm you. When yeah. I'm violent with you, you know. But you may not know that I'm actually violating you. Yeah. I could be violating you for years and you never pick up on it. Yeah. You know, violation is the person who, just, who is working at a, a cashier's, uh, as, a, as a cashier, and they're taking pennies away yeah. day by day instead of thousands of dollars at the end of the day. Yep. It's a little violation. The reason I asked you to contextualize that is because the word social justice is a big word. It's a big word. It's but, a big word. I hear you're talking has, about a very subtle concept. So I wanted to hear a little bit about how are you marrying this conceptually first? Yeah, let's, so, talk so let's, talk about, let's just talk about social justice really quickly. Social justice, the term social justice appears sometimes in the 18th century in the Age of Enlightenment. It's unclear what is being said by different authors and what they mean, but what they mostly are talking about is whether or not monarchy has a right to dominate the common person. It's, 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 but it's not a muddy, it's a muddy word and term. It's no clear definition to it. Later on, in the, at the end of the Industrial Revolution, we really see social, social justice reappear, but it, has a, it is talking about workers' rights, mm -hmm. big industry that has been developed, and the distribution of wealth after post-Gilded Age in America. Mm -hmm. And there is an element of socialism to it. Like, you're having workers decide if they're going, if they're, leaning toward communism or they're leaning toward socialism. And of course, this is the whole like McCarthy era, 1950s, you know, socialist, communist witch hunt of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. These were these workers' rights, kind of, mm -hmm. it was worker, worker movement. Social justice then broadens in spectrum during the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s into in first, America, right? in America, mm -hmm. and first it is really incorporated to the civil rights movement as part of social justice. You know, that African Americans should not have to live under Jim Crow laws of the South, there should be, not be segregation within, in, within schools and businesses, and it moves into women's rights, it moves into the feminist movement. It moves into the gay liberation movement. It moves into um, worker, uh, uh, migrant workers. Mm -hmm. It moves into um, children's issues. Mm -hmm. It moves into poverty issues. It moves into educational issues. So social justice goes from this little thing that really is connected to socialism to this broad awakening of civil rights within a democratic society, right? It's yep. a very American concept. It is, but can I just say, when I heard you give me the history, and it's a terrifically interesting and rich, the pattern that I noticed from the 18th century origins during the Enlightenment period to now is that 
a dominant system was put to test, was challenged. Yes. Whether it's the monarchy, whether it was the uh, capital owning industry owner versus the proletariat right. or, or the worker. And now coming to a larger section of the populations, once again, it is the idea of bringing in rights and justice for not just a dominant majority in this case, it includes the entire population. Popula and why I said this goes all the way up to the 1980s, and I was very, like people might go, well, why, was he, why would he bring up the 1980s? Is because that was the moment when animal rights became part of the social justice movement. It did. It did. PETA, PETA became active. PETA was formed. There was also like an understanding of what was going on in uh, scientific laboratories, in animal testing, in food testing, in cosmetic testing. There was questions whether um, animal agriculture and animal farming was actually um, treating animals well. And so there was this awakening in the 1980s that included animals, and that became part of the social justice movement. Which actually ties back into Loka Samastha Sukhino Bhavantu because it's made all, all beings. beings. All beings. All beings. All in this location. Right? Yes. So you are not... <clears throat> all sentient beings. Sentient beings. Okay. So coming back to now my second question for you. Your, the topic starts out by saying, when will there be justice? So I sensed a certain anger, and, but I want to understand as to sure. what, why, did, why the question? When will so, there be justice? So, my, so I came from a, my family, you know, very wonderful, I mean, family. I did say they were hitters. They were hitters. They were, they were corporate. They did believe in, like, you know, the corporal punishment thing. Um, well, I but, come from a culture but of it was, but, And it was here. also the time. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't really, I think everybody in those days hit. They still hit in public school systems at that time. Um, my parents were some of the first teachers hired at a school, a public high school that had been burned to the ground because of integration in the South. Uh, this small town, the, the Supreme Court said that the schools had to be integrated. It was a segregated high school. The town, the whites in the town went and they torched a school, okay. like torched it to the ground. And the police watched it burn, the fire department watched it burn. Um, it took Al uh, the Alabama state to seven years to rebuild the school. And so I must have been like about um, one years old. And uh, so they were some of the first school teachers hired and they really believed that the South had to change and they really believed that um, there was injustice in the way that uh, African Americans were treated in the South. Both of my parents grew up in Jim Crow South. Um, and so they had witnessed those things. And they worked tirelessly to rebuild community and to uh, try to heal a community that was actually, it never really healed. Probably to this day, it's probably still never really healed. Um, Which town is this? It's a small town called Notasolga, okay. Alabama, in Macon County, Alabama, um, which was a very strange place for this to happen because Macon County is also where Tuskegee is and Tuskegee Institute. And Tuskegee is one of the famous African-American colleges. Mm -hmm. And the county itself is 89% black. Mm -hmm. It's not a white county. It's one of the few counties in Alabama that the majority is African American. And then you had this one little town, this tiny little town in the middle of the, of the county that was a 50-50 ratio. Right. It was, it was equally divided. It wasn't majority white, minority African American. It was equal. And, you know, I, my father was a, a, a hunter, and he would spend his weekends after all these, you know, going to school and having all these stressful things happening, going out and he would shoot little animals. That was his pleasure. He would go and he would shoot birds, he would shoot squirrels. He would, you know, go fishing, he would come home. I mean, so when I was growing up, a weekend seeing animals being gutted in the front yard or the backyard after he'd been out all day hunting and fishing was a common thing. It was so common that I, I never even thought about it. Like it never was in my head that like 
all these little, like he would come home with like 30, 40 little woodland creatures, you know, mm. chopping their heads off and gutting them and skinning them alive and like, you know, cutting their tails off and putting them onto his, his hunting jacket. You mm -hmm. know, it was, I, I didn't think about it. I was raised around it. So I didn't come from a vegan family. In fact, I came from a family that they violated. It was, there was violence and death week in and week out of animals. Um, so when did this change for you? Well, it, when I became a Jeeva Muti yoga teacher. So you literally switched. At post, 43 years old. At, when you were 43, okay. Yeah. So, and I never had really thought about it. You know, and I also like, you know, to be quite honest, you know, before I became a Jiva Mukti Yoga teacher, you know, I spent my time kind of like with an attitude as a gay man, like when people would say to me something about like environmental issues, I was like, who gives a fuck? I'm not going to have kids. I had that attitude and that was, and I had literally said that before. Like when people said, oh, do you recycle? I was like, I'm not going to have kids. I don't give a fuck. Not my problem. So, um, and I blame that on my parents. Like I blame that attitude that I had on my parents because what I saw was, was a contradiction of what they said they believed in. So walking the walk versus talking the talk? Yeah. So, you know, and then, you know, it's taken me years to admit it, but as much as I love my father, my father used to, you know, in private would make horrible racist jokes. You know, we would consider them totally inappropriate now. But he made the same kind of like nasty racial jokes that every southerner made and then would get out there and talk about how like segregation was wrong and that you know people should go to school together and people should love each other and blah 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 so it's interesting that you bring up first it's um it's an incredibly vulnerable topic because you're talking about family history and i want to be respectful but you're talking about this issue of living two lives, basically. Living two lives. Living Saying on the, one thing and doing, doing something Doing another else. thing in the back. So it's like a lack of fidelity or a lack of integrity. There, there's a huge disconnect there, which brings me back to your own journey when you transitioned into yeah. veganism, when you became a Jiva Mukti, uh, you were trained under yeah. the Jiva Mukti lineage. Now, talk to me about two things there. One, how much of it was a bit of a... Like if you're going to be part of the, if you're going to be a teacher in the Jiva Mukti lineage, you have to go vegan first. And then how did it, it was a change that was told that you had to do versus a change that gradually also became more wholesomely integrated, more organically right. integrated, right? Well, yes. so for me, it was like, I, I didn't go to my first yoga class till I was 43 years old. It happened to be a Jiva Mukti class. Within a year, I decided, oh, I'm going to do the Jiva Mukti tr teacher training. Not because I thought I was going to be a yoga teacher or that I was ever going to create a new yoga method or write, write a yoga chant book or anything like that, because I thought I would just like catch up on what I had missed out on. Like I was going as a learning process. Like it was like going and go, I was going to go take a crash course in yoga. Like, you know, that's why I went to the Jiva Mukti teacher training. But I was aware of that Jiva Mukti promoted veganism and I knew that they were going to have it at a mega institute and it was going to be a month-long retreat and it was going to be vegan. So six or seven months before I said, well, I'm going to start giving up meat and dairy and eggs so that I don't have some kind of like, you know, <laughs> bodily <laughs> Allergic <and> shock. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I went and I thought, well, I'll, I'll, you know, I, and here again, like I never thought I was going to teach. I never thought I was going to like create uh, uh, another method, method and run my own studio and write essays and teach yoga seven days a week. I kind of thought, well, this will be easy. But they had, what they did do, and Jiva Mukti did this, and I've heard people really get very upset about their experience um, at teacher, Jiva Mukti teacher training. And you have to remember, I just told you the story, every weekend there was slaughtering of animals at my house. Yeah. But at the middle of the process of the, of the teacher training, uh, they would have these evening sat songs, and there would always be this one night that they would kind of lock us all into a room, and they would show PETA videos. And PETA videos are all basically what goes on in animal agriculture. Oh my God. So you're seeing like, you know, animals being beaten. You're seeing 
you know, chickens having their beaks cut off. Oh my God. So that they don't peck each other. You're seeing, you know, the way that cows are treated as they go to the slaughterhouses and living in their own And these are all pieces. American? Uh, these are all American, American. Okay. you know. Because this is really, I mean, PETA's in America. I mean, yeah. they're around the world. But back in those days, in the 80s, they were really, they were stationed here in America. Yep. So, um, you know, it's, it's easier for me to talk about my family, right, and be dry-eyed than actually kind of talk about animals. Well, there became this realization that I had witnessed, witnessed this abuse all my life. Life, and you had been, you'd, yeah. you'd been complicit. Yeah. And so that was difficult. And that changed me. I mean, I, I just... So did you walk out of there? Now, originally you had made a tactical move. Yeah. You came out of it, actually, with an emotional connection yeah. to, this, the, to this practice, correct? Am I right to say that? Right. It was probably for you a more enduring practice because of that emotional connection that you had. Absolutely. I, and I realized that even if I wasn't going to teach yoga, I had to change. That I had to, I had to change the way that I was living if I wanted the world to be a different world. Absolutely. So I, like, I came home and Bob, who we had been together already for like 15 years, I looked at him and I said, I'm going vegan completely. And um, I understand if you don't want to do this and if you need to, you know, if this is going to kind of end our relationship. So you did a little line in the sand uh, ultimatum at that yeah. time. Yeah, and he said, I'm going to go down on this journey with you. And so, you know, I'm vegan, he's vegetarian, and we're able to live in the house together without fighting. So it's <laughs> it is possible. You know, it's interesting that... and and. You know, you teared up. I, I've never seen you tear up. Actually, if you have one who's known me as a spicy, fiery, yeah. gay yoga teacher, right? Like, like right. I feel like you're like, but right. I will say this, okay, Austin. Because it, 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 it deeply, and I will say this as well, like, because I think there's probably a reason why I'm not watching these videos, because right. I know right. I have blood on my hands, because right. as you know, and let's talk about this openly, because I come from an Indian culture. My father's side of the family is non-vegetarian. Mm -hmm. My mother's side is strictly vegetarian. I mean, veganism was not a concept back then in right. India. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, milk is a very important part of our culture. Right. And the, the divide in my family, familial culture, is that I, my father liked meat. And so my mother, even though she comes from a vegetarian family, cooked meat, meat was yeah. very expensive in India, okay? Yeah. So you couldn't afford to eat meat in great and excessive quantities. It was a, it was a true privilege, it was a true treat. Yeah. So I grew up with all of that. I come from a family of animal lovers, all four of us. Right. My parents and my sister, even more ardently, I'm an animal lover too. At 18, I had this PETA realization and I'm like, guys, we cannot be supporting this. And so the whole family went like vegetarian at that right. time in India. I don't remember why I lost steam. The fact of the matter is, I reverted. I don't know if it coincided with my journey to America, but my parents have actually stayed vegetarian since. Yeah. You know, and so this, as it haunted you, this haunts me to this day. I, I you know what I mean? Like, and so I've always known this implicitly. I cannot make a pledge towards nonviolence or nonviolation, and I know that there's a big missing portion in my own equation and right. how I show up every day. Right, and right. so I also want to tell you that, that when you foreshadowed to me that this is the topic that we're going to talk about this month, I just like how you started preparing <laughs> yourself for your Omega retreat. I started right. looking at my dietary consumption, my habits, right. and actually equally it married with my heart because yeah. I do not want to have a female cow being raped on the damn table because of my dietary habits. Yeah. To the extent that I don't, and, and as long as I live in America, I mean, India is a very different fa uh, farming system. As long as I live in America, I'm going to have to evaluate the choices of my actions. Yes. Not just my words and not just my intentions, my actions, correct? And so I'm on the slower journey than you guys are, but coming back to the emotional basis of connection of justice back to all beings. Yes. And I think here again, we have to keep iterating that this connection between yoga, social justice is American. This connection between yoga and veganism is American. The combination of social justice, veganism, and yoga is American. 
America lives in an incredibly violent culture. Incredibly violent. It has a violent, violent history. It has a violent history. It has a violent cult. It's a violent culture. All we have to do is just look at um, mass shootings in America. And the foundation of the way that animals not were also slaughtered to take land was violent. And so we live in this, even though this is not a hunter-gatherer culture at all, America is no longer a hunter-gatherer culture, we live in this hunter culture. And there's a hunter element to it. So um, I don't want to like just beat up on hunters. That's not the point of this. Um, what I'm trying to say is, is that when you have a culture that's based upon violence, you become numb to the violence and you, um, it becomes the norm. And then other people who say they are being violated get sucked into the violence, which is kind of what I think you were saying when you said, you know, it's easy for you to be vegetarian in, in India. India. But when you come here, you get sucked into the culture. It's not, it's not easy to, it's the, the quality, of, let's just talk about vegetarianism for a second, okay? Which is the quality of produce that you get in India, just like generically speaking, is far superior. And I'm not paying expensive top of the shelf prices to get access to good produce. Right. So there's a level of quality of food there about vegan and going you know, on the milk substitute, I mean, let's just in equate that to the analogy, but the fact of the matter is it's easier for, if in a patch if I'm hungry, the amount of choices that I have are prolifically meat-oriented and right. non-vegan. The, the, the culture, the American culture and the sad diet, the standard American diet, is not really going to be forgiving to the vegan. It's just not. It's not going to, it's, you're making your life harder. I'm not going to lie that. I, I can't. But what I am, what the point of this essay is doing is saying if you care about these social issues, racial injustice, um, gender inequality, um, economic injustice, uh, immigrant rights, um, LGBT, LGBT, QIA rights, yeah. Yeah. Like if you care about any of these issues, environmental issues. You have to start making the connection to the base of the culture, which is a animal agriculture industry that is subsidized by the federal government, that is a constant slaughterhouse of violence, that is putting that out there into the public so that it continues the cycle of violence. And like I said, I woke up in the middle of that, those, watching those PETA videos. videos, realizing what I witnessed as a child, right? I never really associated the two. And the irony that my parents were so involved in racial issues of the South and trying to desegregate the South and make the South a better, a more a tolerable living place for African Americans, and yet at the same time, we're contributing to a violent culture. Yeah. Let's talk about the practice of yoga on the mat and life, and showing up and how, it make, how you show up outside, right? Because when we originally spoke, you said this was really honestly something that you wrote for the teachers, as yeah. opposed to the students. I, and when I say I wrote it for the teachers, I'm writing it for yoga teachers, teachers. around the world. If you're going to stand there and say, Yoga is social justice, which is what the tag, new tagline we're seeing since 2020. Then look deep into the, what you're actually saying. Go deep into it. Don't, don't be my father. Don't be the hypocrite. Don't be the guy who is like out there like killing small woodland creatures and skinning them and cutting their heads off and then consuming them, putting them into your body, and then making little nudge-nudge jokes on the side, yeah. and then standing up talking about love and peace and light. Yep. You know. What you're also 
saying is, again, going back to this issue of integrity and fidelity, going back to the walk the walk and talk the talk, and let's not forget that it's justice as a word is incorporating of all sentient beings, and we should frankly also include the environment, Austin, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I was, I was watching a documentary on Netflix. It seemed a bit hyperbolic in places, but it had some ridiculous, the stats on like consuming one pound of beef equated using... 20, 30 gallons of... Uh, no, 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 it was more than that. Gallons. It was like it's hundreds like, yeah. of gallons I've, of water. I've seen those and numbers. when I saw that metric and I was just like, yes. wait a second, this is not possible. Yes, it, it, and I, I know those, I've seen those numbers and I have to have them in front of me to actually yeah, but like, but, but you're talking but it's about, it's not just human beings of all stripes. Right. It's animals and it's, but then it's also actually, frankly, the, the, the container system. that we yeah. live in. Yes, it's the water system and it's a it's colonization the of and, our ecosystem. You know, we can talk right? about how that, like, you know, pig farms and, you know, the Florida Everglades are poisoning the Everglades, and yet the government and, and even, even certain organizations like Oceana and the Sierra Club, they will not talk about this topic. Why? Because they will lose funding because they have people who eat meat. Yeah. And so when you say, this is part of the problem, then your backer, your financial backer, is angry because they feel like you've, point, you know, you've put them on the spot. And this is the same problem with yoga. It's much easier to run a yoga studio you know, and never talk about this. It's much easier to say, well, I don't want my yoga teacher telling me what to eat. Well, why not? Every yoga shastra I know of says something about food. So why don't you want to talk about this in a yoga class? So going back to taking the harder road, to then you do yoga in the truest sense of like as it being a practice of life means that you are going to have to make hard choices, often not yeah. the most convenient choices. Um, and sometimes contemporary choices. Let's be clear on that. This is a modern issue. This is, you are not, we are not going to find in yoga texts the idea of veganism. We are not going to find in yoga texts the idea of social justice as we're interpreting it here in America today. These are modern issues that we are bringing into the yoga practice. They are, they are issues worth talking about. They're issues worth um, setting down and looking at and incorporating them into a modern yoga movement. But we have to do it honestly and not make the same kind of mistakes that my parents made in the 1960s which was really feel that we need to make these, but not deep down inside make personal changes. My parents never made personal changes. My parents were making outward social changes. Yep. But deep down inside, they weren't making those, those changes in their lives that they really believed in a nonviolent world or yep. a, non, a world that didn't violate. They never embraced the changes that they had to make, the things that they had to change. But in many ways, I would argue that all change begins from within and at home first. I mean, like, who am I? That's to a yoga out, idea. You know? That's a yoga idea. Who am I to go out there and lecture and tell anyone if I'm like, you know, if, if I'm not walking the walk or talking the talk, that is fake. Well, but, that's that's, but see, that's, I think here again, that's, that's coming from somebody who practices yoga, that I'm the, I'm the instrument of change, that I have to change first. What we see in Western society over and over and over again is hypocrisy within government. We see people talk about changes. I mean, you know, you have the situation in, in, in the UK right now. The, the, you know, the prime minister is like, he shut down the country and yet he's having parties at his house. And like, you know, and he's, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I mean, but it's a, the hypocrisy. The West is always operated on hypocritical systems that the rich and the powerful can do what they want to do, and then the masses are expected to do this, and I'll pay the masses lip service to actually manipulate them and get them to do what I want. Changes from the outside, not on the inside in Western culture. Yeah. You do it from the outside. In fact, you can just repaint the building and the building can still be falling apart on the inside. Yeah. And so what yoga says is always said, I am the instrument of change. Ahimsa pratishtayam tat samnido taya varagaha taya varagaha. Yeah. Varagayagaha. Vairagya. Yeah. It's vairat vairatyaga. You know, if I want to have a life that is um, 
non-violation, then I have to change within. And that's a yoga idea. That's, a, that's, a, that's not an, a Western idea. That's not a Western concept. Um, but even in a non, so it was interesting to me, like even for a Western versus a non-Western concept, I was struck by the anecdote, and you should share the story, of how your teacher back in India and what he said about. Yeah. So I, I, I had my teacher, Yoga Sri Sudarshan Kanan is in Chennai and a student introduced me to Yoga Sri probably about five years ago now, I guess, and I followed him ever since. And I never had a discussion with him about vegetarian, vegan, or anything like that. I liked the way that he taught the Bhagavad Gita and I followed, I started following him and you know, meeting with him and studying with him. And over December, I did, we did a, a 30 day meditation with him online that uh, it was pretty intense. And after the meditations, which were about two hours long, he would say, okay, you know, if you need to rest, rest. If you need to have a, a meal, please have a vegan light meal. And um, the last day of the 30 days, he had questions and answers. And somebody wrote in and they said, why are you telling us to have a vegan meal? And he kind of put down the paper and he looked in the camera and he said, look, he said, if it were the good old days when, you know, your grandparents owned a cow and the cow had a calf and they allowed the calf to suckle and be fed and then they went and they milked the cow, he said, I would tell you to have a vegetarian diet. He said, but even India, the good old days are not the good old days anymore. We are now in, in a world where it's industrial farming, and he said the cow, calves are being slaughtered, and the milk, the cat, milk cows are being milked for everything that they're worth. And he said, that's not ahimsa. He said, that's not a sattvic diet. That is a tamasic diet. And he said, so I am now suggesting that you learn to go vegan instead of vegetarian. And that was like, I was like, wow, I didn't even know this about my teacher. Like I, and so it, like I said, it wasn't like he and I had had some talk or anything like that. He, this was consciousness. Yeah. You know, being aware of the, of the interaction and the in, in, interrelation connection between one thing and another, and how the world has changed. So you have this, this you know, Indian teacher in South India who is probably his family has been vegetarian for years, yep. um, saying something very modern and contemporary because the world is changing. And his way to solve the problem is not to buy into it not to go along with it because this is the new cultural norm. Yeah. And that's kind of what I believe this is here, is that if we want a nation that is, has fewer violations, who has, it has fewer harm, is less violent, then we have to look at the subtlety of the violations and violence that we are contributing to the culture that is creating the bedrock of the culture itself. And this isn't going out and storming and like marching through the streets. This is saying, I will change myself and consciously one person at a time will change themselves and we will change society from within instead of outside. That's, that's something to set the focus on for this month and this yeah. entire year, Austin. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. Do you want to chant and end with Loka Samasta? Yeah, we could, we could always. Or we could just do it vocally. Yeah. Uh, Let's just do it vocally. Loka Samasta Suki no Pamantu Namaste. Om Namaste. Shanti. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Shanti.